please open your books or your Bibles to Acts chapter 8, or about verse 18 or so. Pick up there in just a moment and try to finish up this chapter this morning. As we begin this morning, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for another day you've blessed us with, that you provided us with all the physical blessings that we so many times take for granted. We pray, Father, that we'll realize that everything that we have has been a gift from thee. We pray, Father, that you'll help us to realize these are temporal blessings, that uh, our focus should be on the spiritual blessings that we can find in Christ Jesus. We pray that we will... uh, Focus more and more each day on those blessings and that the benefits that, that come from them. We pray, Father, that you'll help us to realize that we're your children here upon the earth, that we should conduct ourselves in a manner that would be acceptable in our sight, that we should have certain characteristics and uh, mannerisms that are reflective of who our Father is and our example that's been set by uh, our brother uh, your son, who gave himself for us. We pray, Father, you bless us this morning as we study. Help us to understand those things that we can make application uh, to in our lives, that we can grow closer to thee. And we pray, Father, that we'll understand the deep need to be able to implement the things that you teach us in the Word. Not just to know them, but to put those into our everyday walks of life. This morning we're mindful of many who are in need of our prayers, especially here at this congregation. We pray that you'll bless them with all the physical needs that they they have and that the doctors that are ministering to them might provide the treatments that would bring them back to their much wanted health. We pray, Father, that you continue with us this day. Help us to prepare ourselves for worship. Help us to have already done that. Help us to conduct ourselves in a manner that we praise and glorify thee as we worship this day. Pray, Father, you'll be with all those who teach the gospel the world over. Help them to hold on to the truth and to teach the truth. We pray, Father, that there may be good and honest hearts that would receive the gospel and change their lives before it's too late. Pray, Father, that you continue with us through our lives each day that we live, that uh, we can live in such a way that we bring the proper perspective of a Christian to this lost and dying world. Forgive us of our sins and shortcomings. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we pick up in Acts chapter 8 where Simon has, I mean, Philip has gone to preach to the uh, people of Samaria. Uh, Philip cannot impart the the Holy Ghost to the laying on of hands. So we see where uh, Peter and John are sent from the church in Jerusalem. And uh, they lay hands upon the, the people and they were able to receive the Holy Ghost. Now Simon, we've talked about in this chapter, a sorcerer who had been tricking the people or who had been um, amazing the people through his uh, sorcery. I don't know exactly what that is, but we, we do know from the scriptures that comparison to what he was able to do versus what the uh, Philip was able to do and showing forth uh, the signs and miracles that he did were apparently no match. Uh, and so it would seem like he was somewhat of an illusionist and that uh, he did not do real things, but the people believed in him and he had quite a following. So when Peter and John come and they're able to lay hands, uh, Simon had believed, and uh, the Bible teaches us, and uh, had obeyed the gospel. But when he sees this ability to lay hands so that people can do certain things with spiritual gifts, uh, he desires that. And so he, um, he wants to have that. Verse 18, And when Simon saw that through laying on the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Well, quite obviously, that seems to be what some people refer to as the universal language, money. And... You know, everybody understands money. So Simon says, well, let me buy that. And um, 
and I don't know what Simon's thinking, but obviously he's thinking to continue on impressing the people, to, to be someone that people follow. Don't know what all's motivating him, but he wants that ability. He says, give me, he says, give me, verse 19, give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee. Here again, we see the, the understanding of the kingdom. The kingdom is not about perishable things. It's not about temporary things. And so that message needs to be brought strong and hard right off the bat to people who believe that their possessions and the material gain that they have is of any value in the kingdom. Now we can use what we have to promote and to try to use the funds to propagate the kingdom through preaching of the gospel. But beyond that, our money is useless. And that's about the only means that we have to help to promote the gospel. To It takes funds to do things. It takes funds to go send somebody, uh, travel, uh, food, uh, lodging, um, being able to sustain somebody somewhere else. Those things take money, but money is just a means that we have to accomplish some things. It's not something of value that we should hold on to. And so here's Simon saying, well, I've got money. Let me buy this power. And Peter says, thy money perish with thee because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. It's, it's not a uh, material possession. It's not something that you can buy with money. And apparently it would seem that this was a kind of attitude or so that, that Simon has. He's someone who thinks materialistically. He's been uh, amazing the people and apparently receiving money because of that. And that was his, it seemed to be his livelihood. So he thinks that money can buy this power. And Peter's quick to point out that's not the case. You cannot buy this power. And um, it can't be purchased money. He says, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. The laying on on the apostles' hands, the, the distribution of the Holy Ghost, of uh, the spiritual gifts that were available, there's no way that Simon has any part in that. Because as we've seen so far, Philip a righteous man, a preacher of the gospel, could not provide those spiritual gifts to people with the laying on of hands. It was limited to the apostles. We understand as we read the scriptures and we see how it plays out, only the apostles could uh, provide the uh, spiritual gifts to people with the laying on of hands. So it was nothing that Simon could get. It was not to, intended to be uh, distributed beyond what the apostles could do. And as we look at Scripture, we start to understand that. It it's, it's unfolds before us. Um, Paul refers to these gifts in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 as, as someone being in their infancy. He says, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I acted as a child, I spoke as a child. But when I became a man, what does he say? I put away childish things. These things were intended for the infancy of the church, the beginning of the church, not to be propagated beyond a certain point. And once the gospel was able to be preached, once that uh, we were able to see letters written from some of the apostles and other writers of the New Testament, and these were sent to various groups of people, they had some guidance at that point to uh, continue to do what was what was uh, instructed by God. Now the interesting thing is um, if you look at what happens today in the religious world there, there are various groups that the whole idea of the word denomination means different divisions. If, if you talk in terms of denominations of money what do we have? We've got 10 cents, 25 cents, a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, twenty on and on, we have these different denominations of bills uh, or of money that we, we talk about, and we all understand that. So when you start talking about <clears throat> the uniqueness of what's happening here and what continues to happen through the writings of the New Testament, is it's the same message every time. 
Now, in the world today, when there are various people who have biblical beliefs to some extent, and I say that because if we all believe the whole truth, we wouldn't have a problem, would we? But what happens is we believe parts of the truth, pick and choose what we want, and so we develop different denominations that become uh, apparent in the world today. So the point is that in, in this particular aspect of what's going on here, the idea is that there's something here for a particular purpose. It had a particular duration to promote the growth of the church, to accelerate it. But it, it went away. It had limitations. And um, so when it, when it went away, then what we have is just the consistency of the Word of God. And so if you look at the Scriptures and all the writers, they're consistent. They're in harmony with what they teach. And if you think there's some discrepancy in there, after further study, you begin to see that it doesn't contradict. It does fit into place. But here's the point. The point is that if we all would follow just what the Bible teaches, then we could be what God wants us to be. And uh, so the point that, that I want to make here is that although they had these things in the very beginning, there was a particular purpose behind them and a limitation behind them. So it was not appropriate for Simon then to have these because that was not God's intent. That was not what God's plan was. And so Peter says, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. It has nothing to do with you, Simon. Uh, nobody that's uh, going to become a Christian is going to have these gifts, the ability to, lay, to pass the gifts on. It was limited to the apostles. And he says, Because that, that you've you thought you could buy these things with the gift, uh, you're, you're in, in, problem, in a problem area here. Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. There is neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. As a Christian, what should be Simon's focus? On his livelihood, on how he's going to continue to amaze the people with his uh, trickery? Uh, what is Simon's focus here as a Christian? To live righteous life before God and to uh, participate to whatever capability he has of taking the gospel to those round about him. And the laying on of hands was not something that was anything associated with him nor what he should be focusing on. And because of that, he said, your heart's not right. He says, Repent therefore before this thy wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thoughts of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Now, here we see what some people refer to as the second law of pardon, right here at the beginning of, of the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, first law of pardon, obviously, is uh, repenting of our sins, confessing that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, uh, being uh, obedient in water baptism to rise to walk in newness of life. Here Simon's done that. The Bible tells us that Simon believed. And it's not us to say, well, did he really believe? The Bible says he believed. And I take the Bible for what it says. Simon believed. But because of his history, because of his past, he has a, a little bit different desire or, um, you know, drive in, in himself and he's, he's looking for these things and he sees some opportunity and he says I, 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 need, I need that because I can continue to do what I do amazing the people well <clears throat> Peter says your heart's not right you're not thinking on the right things and so you need to repent and pray that God perhaps will forgive you of what, you, what you've been doing here what your thinking is and uh, we see Simon understanding completely the, uh, the trail that he's gone down is, is inappropriate uh, as it's brought to his attention. Uh, he says, uh, Peter says, I perceive that thou art in the, in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. You're in sin. You've just gotten out of that because of your belief and the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing your sins, but now you're back into that, the, the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. You're bound again by the sin that weighs you down. And so 
Peter, uh, Simon says, well, uh, pray thee, verse 24, ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which thou hast spoken come upon me. And so he says, I, okay, I understand. Uh, I, I'm doing I'm doing something. I'm the part of the old me. I need to get back to, to what I believed in, and I need to get rid of this old man that, that keeps coming up inside of me. And we all have that struggle. We all have that, that difficulty. We live our lives as uh, human beings. We think like humans. Uh, we have to, to work to overcome that because our tendencies are to, to do those things that satisfy us. What, what makes me feel good? What do I want to do? And sometimes the, the ways of the past will creep back in there and uh, take over if we're not careful. So we have to fight against that. And this is what's happened to Simon. Some of the, the past has come back to, to haunt him and his desires. And uh, he's, he's begging now, please pray uh, to the Lord for me that none of these things which thou hast spoken come upon me. And so <clears throat> that sort of wraps it up with Simon. But we see here that uh, there's going to be more activity involved. And, of course, the people that are being, the conversation or what's being directed, those that are involved in this activity with Simon are Peter and John. Because he's following them around. He's watching what they are able to do. And he's asking for that, that ability uh, with his money that he be, be given that opportunity. So now we're going to pick up, sort of drop that, uh, what's going on with, with Simon in verse 24. <clears throat> in verse 25, we're going to see what Peter and John did. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem. And so we see that uh, they've done their work here. They've uh, imparted the spiritual gifts to the, uh, the people of Samaria. And now they're headed back to Jerusalem. But all the time we see the activity of the apostles. It's interesting to note apparently how active they were in, in what they were doing on a daily basis. But it says here that they, they had testified, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord. Um, I, I find it's interesting here. They're still in Samaria, right? It would indicate that they're in Samaria at this time. They're going to go back to Jerusalem, but they're in Samaria. What has Philip done to the people? He's preached the word. When they came, they imparted the spiritual gifts. But there's always opportunities for growth. And that's one thing that's amazing um, about the scripture. Um, <clears throat> that's why we have classes like this. Someone could um, come in here right after me and say, okay, um, I've been studying over Acts chapter 8, and uh, I've got some thoughts. And they could have thoughts I hadn't even thought of. When I go back to the scriptures a days later, maybe the next day after I've studied something, I see it, and there's something else there. The Word of God is never um, totally harvested. It's never You never find all the, the nuggets, the gold nuggets that are there. It doesn't matter how many times you go back, there's always something you didn't see. There's always something that enhances what you knew about before. Uh, and the more we pay attention, the closer we pay attention, the more you know we're able to, to get information. But you can come back, you know, just hours later or a day later or a week later, pick it up again and you'll find something else. Because the Word of God... We never diminish it. Uh, it. It's an amazing thing. It's sort of like the idea of love. If you had one child, let me ask you a question. Would you love that child? Well, you wanted that child. You brought that child into the world. You love that child. Well, now you have a second child. So your love is halved, right? No, that's not the way love is. And if you had ten children, you would love all of them the same. Now, they might be different personalities, and some of them might be really ideal children, and some of them might really be stinks. But you would love them, right? And that's the way it is with uh, the Word of God. It doesn't matter how many times you go back and study it. There's always something there to, to get from it. 
And if we have that kind of attitude, we'll be able to, to get something out of any time the scriptures are, are opened up to us. So here we have Peter and John that are staying back in Samaria who have already heard the truth and obeyed it, but they're still testifying in their teaching. I think that's interesting. When they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem. But now what did they do? They preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Now we talked about that last week. The Jews and the Samaritans did not get along. Not, none whatsoever. The Jews hated the Samaritans. And the Samaritans felt pretty much the same about the Jews. That's why when Jesus talks about uh, the man who uh, fell on the wayside was robbed and the idea of who came and helped. We have a priest and Levite. They passed by on the other side. But the Samaritan stopped and bound up his wounds, took him to a place, paid for his lodging, said, I'll pay anything else that comes up. And so... That for such a long time there was this hatred, there was a wall between the Jews and Samaritans. The gospel tore that down. The gospel tore down so many things when it came into to existence. And it, it is it's an amazing thing to watch how this transpires. They go to Samaria. Why should the gospel go to Samaria? Because that was the desire of the Lord. The gospel would go out from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Why Samaria? We hate those people. Well, not in the gospel. That's not going to be an acceptable thing. Anybody who obeys the gospel is a child of God. Now that's God working in their lives. That's not them on their own saying, well, I'm just going to obey the gospel. God is the one who adds us to the church. He knows whether or not our hearts are right. And so he adds us to the church, uh, such as we are being saved, those that are being saved. He knows whether or not there's their salvation taking place. It's not a limitation on God's part, but all I'm saying is we can go into the waters of baptism and we can do it for the wrong reasons. And it doesn't do us any good. Only when we do it for the right reasons will God, knowing our hearts, add us to the church. So he knows those who are his. And the Samaritans are human beings. They're his children too if they obey the gospel. And it's just amazing that they continue to do this. Your heritage, your teaching says, Peter and John, when you go back to Jerusalem, you stay away from the Samaritans. But the gospel opens the door. And unfortunately... I don't know if you've had this experience, but I have seen uh, situations where people did not want to send the gospel to different countries because of people's nationality. That's a sad thing because that's not what God wants. He wants all men to be saved. And the gospel has the ability to tear down the hatred and the walls that have been built up and to put us on the same level playing field as children of God. And to me, it's exciting when we have someone come from South Korea or we have someone come from India or we have someone come from Africa and tell us uh, of the things that are being done and, and the souls that are being saved. Because that means the gospel is doing what it's supposed to do. Tearing down barriers and making us all children of God in Christ. So this is an amazing thing. Is they, they, they go through this and they go through all the cities of Samarita, Samaria, Samaria on the way back. All the Samaritans, the villages, and they preach the gospel. Now we're going to see Philip at this point, transition that takes place that uh, Philip's going to now be directed to go somewhere else. We have Peter and, and John going back to Jerusalem. Um, apparently the situation in Samaria is settled. They have the church established. And they, they've left them there with the ability to uh, strengthen and confirm the word through the gifts that 
uh, with the laying on the hands of the apostles. And now the apostles go back to Jerusalem and, and Philip is going to be called away. Verse 26, the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Now, desert in this place, and sometimes in scriptures, can mean a deserted place, or it can mean actually the desert, uh, actually um, hot, dry, nothing really there. Uh, and so it, it can mean uh, either way in scripture unless it's given us a better uh, understanding of what he's talking about but uh, apparently he's traveling in, in either way if it's a desert if it's a deserted place he's basically out by himself riding um, we see the Ethiopian eunuch is going to be riding uh, going back to Ethiopia apparently he's been into Jerusalem to worship verse 27 so he tells him to go into Gaza which is desert he arose and went and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, a queen of the Ethiopians. Now, we want to pay a little bit of attention to this story because we know about it. We know about the, Ethio the Ethiopian eunuch's conversion. And we know that, um, that it's something that we refer to in scriptures a number of times in Acts, the latter part of ch Acts chapter 8. But I want to look at it just a little bit closer. Here's a man of Ethiopia. Now, chances are that this man is very dark-skinned. I uh, don't know how much, but I find it interesting that in this chapter, as we talk about Samaritans who were hated by the Jews, who were considered dog by the Jews, have now been recipients of the gospel that now we have a story in Acts chapter 8 that deals with someone from some other place that would not be considered um, someone that was uh, of the Jewish persuasion. Now, it's indication that if he came to Jerusalem to worship, the, the idea here is that he would have been a proselyte Jew. And that's why he would be in Jerusalem. Otherwise, if he's not of the Jews, he's not following after Judaism, he would not be interested in worshiping at Jerusalem. But the idea here is that even though some people would be proselyted to be Jews, this is someone of a different race. This is someone of a different nationality. And um, he's interested in the gospel. Uh, we see that from the end result. But what he's really interested in, apparently, is he goes to Jerusalem to worship if he's dedicated enough to do that, that he must go to Jerusalem to worship, the Jews would, would come from, from long journeys to do that. Now, if he's from Ethiopia, I haven't done the calculations, but that's quite a distance from Jerusalem. Now, he would have to travel a long, long way to do that. And if you stop and think about that, how is he able to do that? He works for the queen. This was a well-known queen. Candace was one well-known. And uh, here is a servant of hers that would have to go in and ask permission to go all the way to Jerusalem. How long does it take him to go to Jerusalem? Well, if he gets the right connections airline-wise, he's probably going to be there in a couple hours. Not going to happen. He's in a chariot. And so he has been traveling for... Uh, to get there and now on his way back days and days and days it takes a long time because if you look in your maps in the Bible Ethiopia is, is down in um, uh, the southern part of uh, the, the land of Pal Palestine going on down into Egypt uh, I don't didn't look at the map I don't have it memorized but it's down there somewhere it's a long way and he's come to Jerusalem to worship. He's interested in uh, what the, the scriptures teach. And we find that by the way he, he, he comes upon him as he's, we see him reading from Isaiah. But notice here about him. First of all, he's a eunuch. And now that's someone who has been set aside without going into it. It's someone who has dedicated their lives to serving the queen. 
who's abandoned any kind of life. Uh, so he's wor he works for the queen. And it says here that he was uh, a eunuch of great authority. He had great authority. And typically, this, this uh, I, I like this passage that, in this part of the scripture because as we talked about, barriers are be, being broken down. Typically, uh, as we see in scripture, there's, there's sparingly uh, examples of people who were of great authority that obeyed the gospel. And yet here's a man who has great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians who had the charge of all her treasure. And the indications are that they were a fairly wealthy nation. And uh, so here he is, he's got wealth. And so here's the thing about it. The gospel can reach anyone who has their heart open. Uh, there are people who are millionaires today within the body of Christ. You can reach people no matter what level of life uh, with the gospel. And they can truly be children of God. What they understand is the change in focus. Not on material things, although they may be blessed with material things. That's not what they put their life, uh, way their life on. And so here's a man that has great authority and he's over all the treasure. That, there's a lot of money that passes through his hand that he has control over. And um, it says he came to Jerusalem for to worship. An amazing thing that apparently a proselyte, as we said, to come all that distance to worship in Jerusalem. He was returning back to Ethiopia and sitting in his chariot, he, he read Isaiah the prophet. Now, that's interesting that this man is intent enough about the scriptures that he has a scroll that he's reading the scriptures. Um, there's no indication that he's doing this because he's gone on a long journey, he has nothing else to do. He's reading because he has the desire to understand what God has prescribed for us and how he wants us to live. And so he's, he's reading Isaiah. The Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Now, I don't know exactly how he was able to do that. Um, I would say out, out in the desert place, Philip, if he's traveling himself by walking, maybe there's a, a good intercept path that he can take to get there. Chariot, probably horse-drawn traveling probably at a, a good pace, uh, realizing there's a long way to go. You don't want to wear the animals out. But Philip joins himself. I don't know how this took place. I don't know if he was, uh, if he was presented there in a place uh, with the aid of uh, the angel or whatever, but he finds himself uh, in the, this vicinity, and the Spirit says, Go join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him. Folks, there's a lot of little passages like this that could just trigger all kinds of sermons. Have you ever heard of anybody running to, to get the gospel to somebody? I mean, just sprinting so that someone has the opportunity to hear the gospel? I don't think you hear that much. We make efforts we try to spend the money to get people to go. We try to do things. But here's Philip sprinting, running, so that he can teach the Ethiopian eunuch the gospel. The Ethiopian, uh, maybe he used his business connections and his job to get a, you know get a trip up there but here he is reading the scrolls I, I don't know what language Ethiopians spoke and read but I imagine that they didn't have the Ethiopian version of the scroll where he could pick them up yeah so he was reading a foreign language he's a smart guy he knows that it won't just come to him he has to exert effort 
he has to try us. And there's a lesson there, I think, for us. We, we have to try. And we have to exert effort, and we have to get out of our comfort zone in the same way Philip ran up next to him and tried. And I, I, that's a good point, I think. Yeah, I think this is... Uh, I just... I, I try when I look at these words. I mean, if... <laughs> if, if you've ever been in the Bible class, you know, and it's like... Uh, well, we're going to cover chapter so and so today, and and uh, you you're, you've heard the old analogies that uh, of of some classes that that have people apparently have been in because they make these stories. It's like, well, brother so and so, read read verse one, okay? Uh, tell us what that means. Well, it means what it says, okay? Let's go to verse two, you know. Brother so-and-so, read that verse. Well, you got any comments on that one? Well, no, it's pretty self-explanatory, you know. And not to make real fun of that, but the point I'm making is that scriptures, like Steve says, require you to, to, to dig. And there are things there that we just pass right over. It's just amazing. The idea of Philip running to join himself here. I mean, he, he's either in a desert place that's hot and dry or he's in a place where no one else is. No doubt, what, however Philip got here, for him to run, how many of us are in a position to run to catch something? And we're not. Unless our occupation requires us or unless we like to physically train just to, you know, so we can be in better shape or whatever, we're not going to run somewhere. And how many people would run to get to where they could hear or preach the gospel? Yeah, that, that takes some effort. There's effort on the part of the, the eunuch here to try to understand what's going on in the scriptures. And Philip is running. Now, I don't know it, when the Spirit says, Philip, go join yourself at that. Philip said, well, the only way I'm going to get there is to run. I don't know. But I think it's interesting that the importance of the gospel to Philip. Philip was in Samaria. Philip did a great job in Samaria. Philip's now going to go run down a chariot to preach the gospel. And so if you start looking at Acts of the Apostles and what goes on here, the starting of the church and, and the, 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 the push to get the gospel preached, sometimes we, we miss that. We miss that in today's world. Wanting and trying to preach the gospel. Running to preach the gospel. So Philip ran to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? I always think it's, a, it's an interesting thing uh, at this point. How in the world, you know, you're approaching a chariot out there somewhere and you're getting closer and closer how in the world do you hear somebody reading? I don't understand some of these things. Uh, but he heard him reading. Was he reading out loud? Well, apparently he had to be. How do you hear somebody that's whispering the words? You know, reading to themselves silently. You don't hear that. So he's reading this aloud. And he's trying to comprehend it. And he's, and he's reading and he's saying... Okay, I, I see what's saying here, and, and I'm interested in it. And he's, he's citing these words. Now, it would seem to indicate <clears throat> from the dedication of the Ethiopian eunuch, reading the scripture out loud, do you possibly think the Ethiopian eunuch would share some of these things with the people who are traveling with him? I think that'd be highly likely, wouldn't it? And he's reading the scriptures out loud, loud enough to where Philip, as he joins himself to him, understands where he's reading from. And so he says, <clears throat> you understand what you're reading? And he says, how can I except some man should guide me? Well, <clears throat> some may look at this and say, well, you know, the scriptures are just really hard to understand. They're really hard to understand. And if you pick up Old Testament prophecy talking about somebody who's going to be led away like 
the sheep and, and quietly, without knowing what's going to happen, going to the slaughter and giving himself up. How, how would you understand what that is? Unless you understand that the prophecy of who was to come. Now, he no doubt would, would apparently have been a proselyte to, to have traveled and go to Jerusalem for, for, for worship because that was required of the Jews. But how much could he know? How much did he know? He probably got a lot of he got a lot of guys rolling with him, and he's reading out loud, and then someone comes up. Do you understand what you're saying? And he doesn't. He doesn't put out any false pretenses. His character comes through, and he's in he, and he, and his genuine interest to find out. He said, "No, I don't understand." And so, and instead of you know trying to show out in front of his guys or anything like that, he he shows you know his his true character. I, I, I think he's a, a super impressive guy in the New Testament. I really do too. But if you stop and think about it, if someone, if you have authority. And he does, no doubt, as the previous verses have indicated. If you have that kind of authority, someone comes up to you and say, you know what you're reading? How would you take that? First of all, you, you know, you're coming up to somebody who is somebody. You know, he, he has authority. And he has, like Steve says, he, he's, not, he's not just got somebody up there with a, you know, guy in the chariot and he's sitting in the back. There, there's probably several people with him. Because you don't travel with somebody that is, if you are someone of authority from a country, you don't travel alone. You usually travel with guards. If you're that important to the queen, you're going to be protected. So she would send um, some soldiers with him, at least, to protect him. He's important to her. <clears throat> and he's a man of authority. So for someone to come up and, and start questioning, does he understand what he's reading? I just sort of see, maybe I've been <laughs> living in this, this modern era too long. Most people would say, what's it to you? What, who are you? Why are you asking me? What are you even doing coming up here? Don't you see that I'm somebody that's important? None of that took place. So it, it says something about the character of the eunuch. He, he says, no, no, I don't understand what I mean. I need somebody to guide me. Now, Philip didn't come up there, you know, as, as if he had uh, was shining and, and some aura about him that, oh, this man is, is super special. Uh, and so, yeah, come talk to me. He's just a man. A man sent by God's messenger to go and the spirit to go talk to the Ethiopian union. But here's a man who has authority. He has... Um, people around him and even to allow Philip to come up there uh, would have been something unusual because they would typically be watching oh here's somebody coming up they, maybe they, they mean harm but um, the, the eunuch it seems to be someone who is a special character I think and so he says I, I, you know, I need somebody to guide me and if you could imagine, here's the thing that's <clears throat> so interesting to me. If you can imagine, here's a man who has traveled a long way to worship. Now, this, this is just some of the typical Jews. Now, I, this is not to say that, that all the Jews were this way. But sometimes they're like us today. Yep, I went to Jerusalem worship. Check that off. I'm, I'm done. I don't have to, you know, I went to services this morning. I'm done. You know, that, that kind of mentality. He could have easily said, hey, I, I did what I was, I have to go to Jerusalem worship. Check it off. No, this man is still reading the scrolls as he leaves. He, he wants to know the truth. He's intent to hear the gospel. Not necessarily the gospel, because at that point it hadn't been presented to him, but the scriptures and what they teach. 
And so he's excited when Philip comes in and says, well, let me try to explain it to you. You understand how he is? I, I found somebody that can explain this to me. I am excited. I didn't know what it meant. Now I have someone to explain it to me and they can tell me what it means. This man was bubbling over. That, you have to understand that about him. He's not your normal Jew. Yep, done my thing, check it off, I'm done. And so he says, uh, you know, how am I going to do it unless someone guides me? And he desired, Philip, that he would come up and sit with him. Now, that, there's part of it there. He desired him. You know, it's not like, well, you look sort of dirty. I, who, you know, who are you? Why are you? I don't have anything that you, you know, I don't have anything I can give you. You know, you know, we, it's like, well, you could have a drink of water. He's hearing that Philip is asking about the scripture. Philip's not up here saying, could I have a drink of water? You know, it's hot out here. He's asking about the scripture. He's intent on the scriptures. And he says, can you come up here and tell me something? And there's, there's desire on his part to have the scriptures explained to him. And that, that's an amazing thing. I think there are people today, if we could sit still long enough and not be influenced by what they hear from their preacher or whatever, that if we could sit down with them and we could spend the time, we could show people what the scriptures teach. I think it would be exciting to be able to do that. We'll pick up on this next week and see about the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch and some of the other things that are uh, little nuggets in there that we probably haven't thought about before.